Hello there, and welcome to episode one of Girl Boss Interrupted. My name is Helen Roy. I want to begin this podcast by explaining its name to give you a better understanding of its reason for existing. If you enjoy this episode and want to hear more, I encourage you to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Girl Boss Interrupted comes from Girl Interrupted, which was a movie about a group of young women institutionalized in the 1960s for a wide range of mental illnesses. The film stars Angelina Jolie and Winona Ryder. It was released to mixed reviews in 1999, but 20 some years later, the film is considered a cult classic. While the plot characters and general structure are deeply chaotic, at times unclear seemingly to the screenwriters themselves, what remains true and captivating across time are the underlying themes for both lead characters. That participation in the then emerging mid-century trends of careerism and sexual licentiousness literally drives women crazy. Women today continue to relate because in real life, these two forces remain crazy making fixtures of modern society. The difference is now that these once basically distinct vanguard female archetypes at some point fused into one. Now, the expectation for women to become caricatures of a certain brand of masculine ambition and sexuality is no longer an either-or proposition, and hasn't been for a while. This two-faced archetype has a name, Girl Boss. And you can find her on most college campuses in America. She may even be the president of a sorority. The Girl Boss is the face of liberal feminism the centerpiece of limitless optionality. She's the having it all, doing it all, knowing it all. Leaning in, well-behaved women rarely make history. Vocal feminist, part-time activist, full-time company cheerleader. She is everything all the time. Sexually uninhibited, politically correct, yet professionally inspired. She accepts no boundaries to her ambitions, nor does she keep any of her own an empty vessel both for corporate America and the American everyman, as inoffensive as the 50s housewife, but with an ironic veneer of edgy righteousness. In accordance with this representation, generations of girls have been explicitly instructed to prioritize the professional over the personal, freedom over family, and independence over everything. You go, girl. In demanding nothing but complete autonomy, of course, the girl boss has required nothing of anyone else, least of all men, who now enjoy both the benefits of consequence-free sex and 50-50 financial and cohabitational arrangements with her. And women enjoy what exactly? Status, the feeling of acceptance that comes with doing what you're told. Of course, no one is enjoying this charade. Women are as upset by life now as the girls at Claymore Asylum, the setting of Girl Interrupted. But their daily routines of uppers and downers was managed by a no-nonsense Irish nurse. We have an app for that. You don't need to do more than a cursory glance at social media over the past few years to know the truth. That women are unsatisfied and exhausted by the deep ambivalence of the modern female experience, boiled down most basically to endless swiping and striving represented by the fiction of the girl boss. Even men, the superficial beneficiaries of the modern arrangement, have grown to resent both the career woman and the sexually uninhibited woman for the real competition and fear of inadequacy that those facts bring to the surface. Men resent no one more than themselves. In fact, these so-called benefits are not only completely superficial, but reaped by fewer and fewer as time goes on. For incels and feminists alike, Pervasive lovelessness festers in the form of mutual resentment. Both see misogyny and misinjury, uh, respectively, everywhere, and both, in their own ways, are completely correct. Relations between the genders have never felt more tenuous. But something happened more recently, more acutely, in 2020, when in many ways coronavirus killed the girl boss, 
With the pandemic in full swing, all of the sudden, the millennials, the largest demographic cohort of women since their boomer mothers, as well as the most heavily indoctrinated into the cult of You Go Girl, found themselves without the real corresponding components of swiping and striving. In other words, the bar and the office. Without these distractions, a few things became clear. For single millennial women, first came the dull and consuming loneliness. Publications were flooded with pieces by women suddenly overcome with anxiety about their lack of stable, non-superficial romantic relationships. Alone in their apartments, they perceived a lack of love in their lives, and many became rather acutely aware of what two years of lockdown, precisely as they crested 30 years of age, might mean for their coupling prospects and fertility. All of a sudden, the difference between 28 and 30 felt more dramatic. This biological self-awareness brought several more questions to the surface. Uh, in fact, the anti-birth control movement began to find traction on TikTok and Instagram, as well as several more trends relating to slow living, anti-consumerism, leaning out, femininity, anti-work, and most significantly, anti-hookup culture. For a significant, though still minority, chunk of millennials who have had children, a different story played out, but with a similar outcome. As of October 2021, three million women had left their jobs for pandemic-related reasons. Put simply, working from home, while also having kids home from daycare and school, highlighted the tension between domestic and professional responsibility that would have once been relieved through outsourcing. Early pandemic quarantine protocol drew on and became what the narrative makers dubbed the new normal, an only slightly less tenuous situation where yes, kids can go back to get daycare and yes, mommy can go back to work, but either the slightest of sniffles from your kid or the whim of the wrong lawmaker could throw a family into personal and financial chaos for a long time. Under these conditions, Child care became simultaneously too expensive and too unpredictable to justify a mother's paycheck for many middle-class American families. So these moms also went to TikTok and Instagram to express their frustrations with being everything all the time, but nothing they actually enjoyed. The homeschool movement exploded and again found lots of traction through social media. The working class woman in her own category is generally more concerned with the reality of making ends meet than achieving some superficial, superficial image of feminist perfection, but ironically, despite being least likely to buy into that image, is truly hardest hit by its consequences. In other words, it's all fun and games when elite women play around with sexual boundaries. Poor women are made much poorer by the normalization of premarital sex and absentee fathers, who, despite everyone's insistence are disposable, are actually the key indicator of a child's emotional and financial stability in the long term. Additionally, it's all fun and games for already rich women to dabble in BS email careers while their kids receive the royal treatment at luxury daycares in the country's wealthiest zip codes. For poorer families, working as a woman is less a dream than a necessity. Girl bossism looks great on Gwyneth Paltrow, less great on the woman who must return to her workplace within days of giving birth while she's still bleeding and while her infant is thrust into a state-subsidized program where abuse and neglect is not as uncommon as we'd like to believe. These were the women working the jobs that couldn't be done from home over the pandemic. These women suffered most of all. So yes, the girl boss archetype caters to a specific subset of bougie, privileged, urbanite women, but women of every background must contend with the effects of this archetype being thrust into the mainstream, and that's really the problem. Mainstream media headlines over the past few months have described a dramatic reversal in women's empowerment in America. Feminist journalists have picked up on the changing tides. They are beginning to acknowledge the grassroots rebellious energy that is described rising in popularity through TikTok and Instagram. However, for these writers who are fully bought into girl bossism, the mass exodus of women from the workplace and the rising tide of sex negativity, a term coined by 
writer Catherine D, who will be a guest on this podcast, are both tragic casualties of simply misunderstanding the rules of the game. They are determined to remind us that resistance to the feminist status quo is a very bad thing. To be fair, it must be for them. Towing the line is what gave them their careers. But contrary to their protestations, it's not simply that we haven't girl bossed hard enough. It's not just that real sex positivity has never been tried. No, in reality, some significant subset of a generation of women raised according to this particular life script across classes finds themselves completely disenchanted with their own lives. Something is happening, something even bigger than the real and meaningful cost-benefit analysis related to the pandemic. I'll conclude by returning to the topic of film, which is often so illuminating as a cultural pulse monitor. Reappearing on various nominations lists this year is an indie international film directed by Norwegian Joachim Trier, entitled The Worst Person in the World. The film centers on a millennial named Julie, who bounces between lovers and occupations, succeeding rapidly in a certain sense in everything that she tries, uh, but never deciding to see anything through to the end for fear of betraying some vague inner sense of authenticity or personal liberty. Matthew Schmitz for the American Conservative wrote an insightful review that I think deserves repeating. Quote, Julie is a millennial woman in modern Oslo who slides toward her mid-30s with no certainty about what she should do or whom she should love. Anything that gives life lasting shape also limits its possibilities. Choosing one future requires rejecting countless others. Julie recoils from commitment and so ends up alone. The worst person in the world explores a different sort of midlife crisis, one that many millennials will undergo. They will not face the classic realization that their children are growing up and they are growing old. They will, instead, confront the fact that they will never attain their image of adulthood. Death will come before they marry, have children, or buy a house. Soon the majority of my fellow millennials will have turned 35, the age Julie is approaching at the end of the film. The oldest millennials are already in their 40s. Social scientists have painstakingly described our low rates of marriage, childbearing, and homeownership. But Trier gets at something that is harder to capture, the ambivalent experience of people who came of age in those years. It seemed that we could do what we wanted except form lasting relationships, go where we liked, unless it was home. For no other generation have the possibilities been so limitless and the reality so limited." Unquote. The success of the film together with this rising tide of grassroots countercultural energy and the occasional but reluctant acknowledgement from the mainstream signaled to me that a broad awakening to the real limitations of girl bossism is underway. The long-standing ideological model set forth for women does not account for the limitations of time, for the world beyond the self, for love, and especially at the intersection of all of the aforementioned for women's natural desire for children. For that reason, it has caused much pain. Chronic conditions often take a while to understand fully. As teenagers, millennials once related to the angst of the characters and girl interrupted, but the root causes of their problems felt more ephemeral. Their subjugation felt more like an imposition than a choice. As adults, we may relate to Julie's angst, but it has become uncomfortably clear that her angst is the result of her own slave-like devotion to the very ideas that hurt her in the fir first place. We've begun to realize our own role in our own misery. This is an important first step. The purpose of this podcast is to take the next step, revolt against the modern girl or at least the shoddy simulacrum of womanhood that girl bossism has for so long upheld. I have questions. Why was the ideology so successful in the first place? How did it enter the mainstream? Who did it? Why? And ultimately, why has it failed? Is what's happening a dramatic reversal in women's empowerment? Or 
the dramatic rupture of a powerful web of lies, or some combination of the two. If the self-adulating feminist media class is shocked and horrified that the girl boss archetype is finally visibly crumbling against the pressures of reality, uh, why has it been their first impulse to criticize women's choices rather than the disembodied image those choices betray? Most importantly, what does it mean to live virtuously as a woman in the 21st century? How can we do better? Happiness will elude us until these and several more important questions are answered. So here we are. This podcast is an opportunity for me to speak to extremely thoughtful women who, in some way or another, through their work, are illuminating alternative pathways for how modern women can live. Additionally, it's an opportunity for me to document what I perceive as a true grassroots, fundamental political change in women's lives. We live in interesting times. So I sincerely hope that you join me here and that we learn something new together in every episode. Once again, if you enjoyed what you heard here and you want to hear more, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm Helen Roy. I thank you for tuning in today, and I look forward to chatting again soon. Bye.